everybody. Welcome back to a show of Citizens for Progress. The discussion we're going to have today is economic health of the worker in the state of New Hampshire, wages, and a possible minimum wage of 15. Exactly as this show is being filmed right now at the New Hampshire State House, they are going for an override vote on a minimum wage of $12 an hour. By the time this air shows, this show airs, we'll know what the result of that was. But uh, we're going to be discussing the health of the workers in the state of New Hampshire. And let me yeah. introduce, let me uh, let the guests introduce themselves here. Yeah, well, I'm Cindy Perkins, uh, part of the SEIU International Union. Uh, I work for the state of New Hampshire in employment security, so I help people find jobs, look for jobs. I'm very familiar with the state of the uh, current job market. And I'm very honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And my name is Melissa Moriarty. I'm the communications administrator of the union that Cindy is a member of, SEA, SEIU Local 1984 in Concord. And right. your union represents mostly what type of workers? Well, we represent state workers. It's the Service Employees International Union. So the union as a whole represents janitors, health care workers, and a lot of public employees. In this state, it's mostly public employees, but not entirely. Um, state, uh, county, and municipal um, sections. Okay. Now, we want to... I wanted to start off with uh, basically everybody that works, I mean, regardless of who you are. You have to have a place to live, you have to have food, you have to be able to pay for your transportation. And once mm -hmm. you get these basic needs paid for, after that, whether they call it disposable or discretionary income, I happen to like the word discretionary because mm -hmm. I get to choose how I spend that money. The other money I don't get it. I don't get to choose. I need a place to live. I need food to eat. Yeah. I need to pay my utility bills. So, once I get to that point that my wage covers my needs, then I'm able to drive the economy by spending that money at, for other things. Mm -hmm. And um, now you were telling me about a policy institute study that showed that the lower half of the workers the workers making the lower half of income are getting less capable of doing that? Yeah, this um, study came out by the New Hampshire Fiscal Policy Institute. It first came out August 30, 30th of 2019 and was updated September 16th. And basically the study identified that the fastest growing job market was actually low-paying jobs or jobs that people have to work more than one part-time work and the wages are actually not keeping up with the cost of living so 50 percent of the people working are seeing their wages and ability to to pay for their basic needs decreasing and that they have less money to participate in the economy and right. um, yeah it was kind of disappointing reading that 50% of people's wages are going down. Yeah. And, and the top 50 uh, are somewhat going up. So it's just uh, we're getting winners and losers, and that's a lot of losers. Right. And the losers are the people who are less able to pay their bills in the first place. That's. I would like to get a little bit into how this economy runs um, and, and your story about what you do as an electrician was a great way of illustrating that. Okay, so, so I'll share my story as, as an electrician, and then we can dive into some of the reasons why I experienced that. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, in the electrical field since 1972. And when I first started working, I did a lot of residential, a lot of industrial, a lot of commercial work. It was, it was mixed. And then as time progressed, NAFTA got passed, what I saw was the industrial work that I was doing became almost non-existent. And I started doing a lot of commercial work, building malls and places to sell mm -hmm. product. And we had moved from a country that wasn't making the product anymore to one that just sold it. And it changed the employment to a lot of retail work being available. And uh, 
the next boom I saw was actually HUD housing. Because now that we had all these people that were no longer making things, they were making less money in the work in retail to sell the things that we didn't make anymore. And then we, they didn't have enough money for their housing. So the next boom I saw was HUD housing. I started build, building HUD housing all over the state. And what I saw trans, transform after that was, I mean, we hadn't worked on our electrical grid for over 40 years. And uh, it was, when I went into the control rooms, there was lots of duct tape and bubble gum. And <laughs> <Ouch>. <laughs> it's amazing what you can fix with duct tape. <laughs> but uh, uh, the work transformed into the uh, power supply. You know, we mm -hmm. built the plant in Newington, the Gojans, and down in um, the chiller plant changed from a coal plant to a multi burn plant. And Newington put in the G, at the time it was a G gas cogen there. So mm -hmm. I, I worked on those in Seabrook and I, I worked on produced places that produced electricity. And then it was, now we had to transfer that electricity around the state. So the grid had to be worked on, the transmission and distribution. And that work is, a lot of that work still going on because yeah. we haven't got up to date on it. But it was just really strange that, you know, here all of a sudden I'm doing all in industrial work and I love it. It's complicated. It, it, mm -hmm. It's complex. It really taxes. There's a lot of skills involved in doing it. And it just disappeared. And the housing, well, yeah, sure. housing, I mean, it's work and it's kind of, it, it occupies time and it's, it's not as enjoyable to me. I like more complicated work. Pays the wages. So, so what I see then is with the opening of global markets and globalization, we, the nation of the United States, produces less and less. So we ship out our raw materials, we get them back as finished goods, and we sell them. And those jobs are much lower paid. Therefore, the workforce, which used to be the unionized manufacturing workforce that Henry Lo Ford dearly loved and paid high wages to. Great quote from Henry Ford. If I don't pay my workers, who's going to buy my cars? So we go from that to buying and selling. Currently, consumer spending makes 68% of our economy. Now, somebody who's making millions and shipping it to the Caymans is not buying stuff. They are not actually contributing to the economy. They are shipping it offshore. Um, the people who tend to buy things are the people who are lower paid. That's the first place your money goes. So I think we should look at the real drivers of our economy are the, those retail workers, those fast food workers, those people who are buying stuff, the middle class the middle class workers who are buying stuff, using stuff, replacing stuff, because that's how our economy runs. 68% 60, of it that's on buying and selling stuff. That was one of the most disappointing things about reading that workforce study was seeing that the, actually the increase in work opportunities uh, is in the area of the bottom 50 percentile of, of workers and that area of the economy is decreasing in cost of them being able to afford what they have to, that their wage rate is going down. I have totally seen that in the Employment Security Office. So the jobs that come available to me, packing up gift baskets for Christmas, um, manufacturing and assembly jobs that pay 12 to $15 an hour, not too good. Um, retail, oh, the retailers are always complaining they can't get enough people. Um, I'm seeing health care, especially the lowest end, home health care. Who's going to take care of your mom? That's a big deal, and they don't pay them very well. Um, and I'm not seeing a lot of the jobs that pay well. I'm certainly not seeing a lot of the high-skilled jobs. We can train people for CNC programming. But there aren't that many CNC programming jobs. They're there, not a lot. Um, so it's not an answer for most workers. So in, in, 
in having a minimum wage, I mean, yep. does that mean that people's wages, real wages, are going to be better, that they're going to be able to afford to pay for this? I mean, we don't have to explain to the people out there that are working that they have to work more, they have to either take a second job, and they just don't seem to be getting anywhere. They seem to be mm -hmm. either running in place or going backwards. Yeah, yeah. I think actually there are enough people feeling that, that it's contributing to this general feeling of fear, despair, anger, the sort of hovering in America's air. Um, it's, it, there's a desperation to knowing that you're working just as hard or harder than you used to and you're not doing as well. Um, but yeah, minimum wages. Yeah, I don't want to go off topic, but that, yeah. that looks like it almost be partial explanation for the drug ec epidemic we're experiencing. Right. right, or mass shootings, who knows? Who knows? Could all be there. Um, in terms of, yes, obviously it benefits the bottom people who get the minimum raise, wage increase. It also benefits people who are making a little more than minimum wage. If I was the supervisor of a bunch of minimum wage people and all of a sudden they're making as much as I am, I'm like, hey, 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 hey. What we find is the employer raises the wages of the, about the bottom 20%. So you get a ripple up effect, a trickle up, if you like, effect <laughs> from a minimum wage gain. Um, now there's tons of studies on the cities and states that have made minimum wage increases recently. And the studies have been a little bit mixed. Large majority of them show no decrease in number of jobs, no decrease in, um, well, let's just say some businesses do close, but other businesses thrive. Um, for example, the Harvard Business Review found that the restaurants that were rated 3.5 stars tended to close, and the restaurants that were rated five stars had no, showed no effect. So, what can I say? How about competing the old-fashioned way with quality? So, uh, so yeah, it does seem to be good for the economy. Prices do go up, but they don't go up very much. That's not the first response of the employer. So it sounds like price elasticity in some ways, which means that People that are purchasing a product, if the price increases too much, they're going to find an alternative product or not buy right. that product. Mm -hmm. So that the increase in wage doesn't get totally negated by the cost of goods being right. produced by right. uh, that we have to buy. Right. And that's because there are a lot of places where a uh, company can change its costs. So if its labor cost suddenly peaks, it can pay its... CEO a little less. It can, um, remember the cost of goods pretty much stayed the same, coming over from China or Mexico or wherever they come from. So that can stay the same and that offsets or moderates the raise in wage. Um, sometimes companies change it. In Seattle it was found they reduced the number of hours that people got to work. So that was an unfortunate effect of the raise in the minimum wage. And yet the overall wage, the overall effect for the workforce was positive. So, so I think everything's mixed. I think we have to discuss the inequity of uh, income distribution. Oh, my word. Because that's something that changed over time. It used to be that a CEO would make about 20 to 30 times that of the average worker. Mm -hmm. and that's changed drastically from that. Oh, yeah. So one of the concerns is that, that, is that as we raise the wages of the worker, that they're not going to pass on these costs in a reduced CEO pay or a, at least a CEO pay that's not increasing. I mean, what's, what's the average? Three to 500 times that of the average worker right now? Right now. And that kind of inequity, it breeds discontent. It breeds boom and bust cycles in an economy. There's so much wrong with this kind of inequity. There's so you, much wrong. Are you familiar with the SP 500 study that came out almost two years ago in regards to no, the tell U, me. UN study as well in regards to inequity was pretty, I, I had read both. And basically what these two studies said, whether it was the UN study on economics and concern 
of developing countries and, and developed countries. Developing countries were actually doing better than developed countries. But what was happening was you have all the income being heading to the top. They don't spend income. They save it. They, they do other things with it, mm -hmm. not necessarily invest it. A lot of it just sits still and it's idle. Whereas someone at the lower end of, or middle of, of the scale, your medium workers, um, they spend the money when they get it. I mean, they save mm -hmm. it for, yeah, I want to improve the TV set my family has. I want to take my family on vacation. These are, take them out to a restaurant. These are the extra things that if they're making sufficient income that they're capable of doing. So it, the, both studies found that if we paid, if there was a less inequity in the pay scale and people at the lower, middle and lower end were getting more, that we would develop a steady state economy as opposed mm -hmm. to a boom-bust economy because now we have the people in this New Hampshire study, that's 50% of us, now have money to spend in the economy if they were paid more. Right. Whereas if they're not paid more, their wages are going down, they're spending less, they're having difficulty um, providing for their family, and they have to be mm -hmm. reliant on, on the government for services. Yeah. I mean, yeah. everybody, I like to work and make my money. Would you like I to like to make that? enough money to support my family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say when I think about all of this, I think about it for me specifically in terms of actually my, my generation as the millennial in the conversation, right. I think that uh, my generation has suffered quite a lot because of the overwhelming amount that most people have in student debt, which delays their right. ability to purchase homes and become homeowners, which oftentimes per delays their decision in starting families if they decide to start them at all. Um, so when I think about uh, wage inequity, um, I think about it in terms of how I see it affecting my, my own peers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's... You have a lot of, of information on exactly what the costs were and w what workers would have to make to be able to survive and provide for their family. That is downright amusing. Okay, so we're in Manchester. The... We can discuss what the average cost of an apartment is. Um, the New Hampshire Business Review said that as of July 2019, the median monthly rent for a two-bedroom apartment was $1,370. Informal surveys among people who are actually searching for apartments right now suggest that it's considerably higher. But let's say $1,370. Now let's look at two parents caring for a two-year-old. All right, they go off to work and they make $9 an hour in retail. All right, so one of them goes off to work because the other one's staying home because the cost and the availability of childcare is a whole nother story. But anyway, one person goes, let's assume 40 hours a, a week, let's assume four and a third weeks in a month, that's 173 working hours, times $9 an hour, comes out to $1,370.16. Don't spend that 16 cents all in one place. Okay, <laughs> but 13.70 of it just went to rent. Um, if they were making 15, they, it would come out to 2,595, less 12% for federal income tax is about $2,283.60 minus rent, $913.60. Not a lot, but it will get you through a month. Uh, a lot better than 16 cents will. So what does the family do if they can only find $9 jobs? Okay, so both of them go to work. Now they're making, after taxes, <coughs> they're making $3,114 gross. So they qualify for state child care support. At step four, DHHS will pay 87.5% of the cost up to $796.18 per month. That's my money. That's your money. That's your money. This is tax money, folks. That HUD housing that you were talking about, that's our money. Effectively, 
An employer paying $9 an hour is shifting the cost of doing business onto the rest of us, whether we choose to purchase from them or not. Just wrong. That's just wrong. And I think we really have to look at that. Um, at $9 an hour, that family qualifies for Medicaid. At $15 an hour, they don't. It's really pretty straightforward. A full package of welfare pays, if you, if you got the whole thing and you had a big family, all right, um, it still comes out to more than you can make in the average starting job, $19. So we really have to look at the wage thing, in, including, you know, we have to include the idea that we want people to have the dignity of supporting themselves, and we don't want to pay for them. <laughs> so let's get them supporting themselves. You know, one of the things I look at is it, it is possible for businesses to pay their employees more. If we look at, like, Costco versus Walmart in, right. the, in the treatment of employees, it, it, do you have uh, more specific information in regards to that? Um, I don't have the Costco numbers. Uh, I know that Walmart claims that it just went to $10 an hour Actually, what they meant is they went to nine dollars an hour, and after six months, you get to nine fifty, and then you get to ten dollars after a year. But, and and they say they're going up to eleven now. Um, Target has said it's going to fifteen. It's already paying considerably more than Walmart. Somehow, Target's not dying. Yeah, I think some of the research I had seen on Costco was they have a different business philosophy. Mm -hmm. Basically, their philosophy is. So if they pay their employees more, they'll do a better job. They don't have to have recidivism, well, not recidivism. Retraining, constant retraining. The cost of retraining because people are constantly moving to take other jobs that pay more. So I, I believe their pay rate was up close to $18 an hour, above the $15 minimum. Nice. And they're still competing in their marketplace. They have a... Yep. A healthier because their employees also have health insurance. Yeah. They have a healthier workforce. They have a workforce that's dedicated to working for them because they get in reasonable wages. They're able to be healthier. They can have their time with their family. They don't have to work two jobs because they can have the one job that's capable of paying for their cost of living. My sister won't shop anywhere else. She's a Costco member and a Dedicated fan. It's very good. Um, now, there are objections that people like to throw out. Um, plenty of them. Uh, one of the ones I hear from, or hear from, is uh, fellow workers like myself. Mm -hmm. They're worried that if the wages of, I'm an electrician. I've taken a lot of training to get the wages mm -hmm. I get. If they're saying pretty much someone at minimum wage lacks training or they're doing jobs that people wouldn't ordinarily do. I mean, they're saying it's high school students that are doing the uh, minimum wage jobs. Right. Does the data support that? No. The number of high schoolers in the workforce is dropping. The number of elders in the workforce is rising. Um, and a lot of those low-level, low-wage jobs are being held by people. I think it's 30 percent, 40 percent have uh, families. They're supporting families on it. Um, another th version of that that I hear is, you know, why should a burger flipper get as much as I should? That a great deal of disdain for people in that line of work. And let me first say that somebody working at a fast food joint is dealing with burns, mm -hmm. is dealing with harassment, typically. The uh, populace does not particularly respect them. I have talked to people who had shakes thrown in their face. I mean, just amazing, amazing stuff. You would not treat somebody in a suit that way. No, absolutely. I remember at one point there was a, some sort of phenomenon, I guess you could call it, where it was popular to throw the shakes back at, at the takeout window. Yeah, there were there was like a slew of videos where the waiter would hand the driver mm -hmm. his or her shake and, and throw, throw it back. back. Yeah, and then drive off. 
I remember this several years ago, a lot of videos oh, coming fun. out and doing that. Fun. Yeah, so I think no. that there's a huge disdain for certain types of labor. Right. And no respect for it. Exactly. Now, I'm an office worker. I make a decent weight. Um, nobody does that to me. I've been, I've been treated badly in customer service sometimes, but not, not like that. Mm -hmm. I get paid a decent wage, and honestly, I don't think I work as hard as some of those folks. So we're less than five minutes, and mm -hmm. if we were to wrap this up in a... In Free market. That'd be the first thing to talk about. How come this isn't, you know, let the market take care of the wages. If it's so hard to find workers, people will raise wages. Okay, I am seeing rising. It was 850 during the Great Recession for a high-speed assembly line worker. That was disgusting. But the fact is that the free market assumes free choice. If you remember the stories of the railroads and the uh, company store where the workers are isolated out on this mountain where they're digging the railroad, the company owns the store, the company charges whatever prices it wants, and the worker is in debt from day one and never gets out. It's effectively slavery because they can't leave because they owe money. Well, to have that free market effect, one is you have to have competitors and there right. has to be competition. Right. And what we're seeing is like Walmart is one of the major employers, so actually as opposed to having a competitive wage, they dictate the wage because they have enough power to be able to do that. Right. Because of the amount of people that they hire. So Absolutely. it's not a true competitive. It's not free. Right. And then and that brings us, when I hear him speak about power, to the idea of having to, to help balance that power. Right. Which some people have the ability to join a union. Right. To counteract that balance of power for coming from one side. We can look at a marvelous chart of the rise of inequity and the th fall of union membership. At this point, it's 6% or less of the private sector are unionized. It used to be considerably higher than that. A union gives the workers equal power to bargain with the employer. Individually, they don't. The employer just fires them. No problem. So yeah, unionization is very, very important in terms of balancing this inequity. So to close this, on your data, Mm -hmm. what we have for the cost of someone to live in the city of Manchester. Yeah. The minimum wage of 15 is not to a, gonna, going to accomplish that. And, I mean, that's getting closer, but we're still not getting to the point of having a living wage where you're actually making enough money to be able to live. And um, Well, if we assume that our two parents need a two-bedroom apartment, um, what they've been doing, and I actually know of a family that's doing this, is the kids get the bedroom and they sleep on the fold-out couch. Sad but true. But yeah, this is not a living wage, but it's a lot closer. And that's where we got to go. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we've run out of time. We probably could have kept going for quite a while. We touched oh, subjects yeah. that need further exploration. And I hope you watched more shows. Thank you for watching this one.